who is joining us, everyone who's joining us by Facebook, by our conference call. Um, we thank God for you, you, and you who have been patient and who have waited for the Lord. We have been dealing with the book of Acts, and in dealing with the book of Acts, we have seen how the church has been birthed. Uh, we saw beginning in the book of Acts that Jesus told his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And then those words, uh, which specifically was spoken by the prophet Joel, it says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream dreams, and your old men shall see visions. And so that's where we are today in terms of Acts chapter 1. Then we move on, and then in Acts chapter 2, we see the fulfilling of the Holy Spirit, the downpouring of the Holy Spirit uh, as it came on the day of Pentecost. And on that day, uh, the Bible says that they were all together all in one place, in one accord, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And when that Holy Spirit came, uh, the Bible says that people heard the gospel in their own language and others were, uh, others were astonished that these disciples or was speaking the word of God in languages that they knew not of. But they were sharing that gospel and people were coming to know Christ. And then the Bible says that they were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. And we talked about the apostles' doctrine as we talked about our confession of faith, our affirmation of faith. And you know what that affirmation of faith says, that I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended to, into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, for the Father Almighty. And from this he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the church universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins and the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. These are what we call the, the affirmation of faith. And from that, we talked about not only we talked about the importance of your vows, as we saw with Ananias, that supposed they had uh, to the church, but instead they kept back a portion for themselves. And we talked about how God wants us to honor our vows. And that was a big thing. And then we talked about a man by the name of uh, Stephen. Uh, do y'all remember Stephen as we spoke so profoundly about his life? And we talked about Stephen and how his witness uh, was so great that uh, many came to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And in knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he was brought into the Sanhedrin Council, he was brought there, and while he was with the Sanhedrin Council, um, he spoke so boldly about them persecuting Jesus and killing him, and he basically undressed them publicly. They became so uh, upset with Stephen until they took him out to the edge of the city and they stoned him. And when they stoned him, there was a young man by the name of Saul who held their coast. That was in Acts chapter 7. Then when we got to Acts chapter 8, we meet another character uh, that steps on the, st on the scene by the name of, of Simon uh, the Magician, or Simon the Soothsayer. And there's a guy, another apostle by the name of, of Philip, who was preaching about Jesus the Christ. And when people heard Philip and saw the works that he was doing, and compared it with Simon, Simon the soothsayer, or Simon the magician, recognized that what he had been doing was not uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but by his own. You see, Simon used his gift. They profit from it in the kingdom of God. And he recognized that he had been living life, and from that point on, he changed his life and accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and his Savior. 
And after doing such things, he repented and he was baptized. And Philip went on his way, and on his travels, he came down from Jerusalem to a place called Gaza, and there he met an Ethiopian eunuch. And he spoke to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he preached to him, and in the end result, the Ethiopian uh, got baptized, and from that opportunity, he spread the gospel uh, throughout uh, Africa and other places, and Philip continued preaching about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, convincing others. Then in Acts chapter 9, where we left off last week, we come in contact with a, a character by the name of Saul. Saul was a very educated man. He was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He considered himself to be uh, the cream of the crop as it relates to being a part of the tribe of Judah, being uh, in the lineage of David. And he thought he was doing a great service to God by persecuting the Christians. And by doing that, what he, he ultimately did was he was on his way. He was traveling down a Damas the Damascus Road. And the Bible says that there was a light that shone from heaven. A voice came after that light that said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it's from that standpoint that Saul says that I, the, the voice said, I am Jesus the Christ, the one who and then from that point on, Saul was blind. Uh, to recognize that uh, he's not able to see now. He thought he had sight, but he didn't have insight. And from that, from that he was led, uh, I believe, and uh, uh, for three days, the Bible says he was without sight. Now, when we get to Acts chapter 9, we stopped at verse number 10. And we're going to pick up at verse number 10. We're going to read that again. And from there, we're going to see Saul's um, evolution and what God, how God can use someone with a checkered past for his glory. Now, when we dealt with Saul last time, um, we dealt with a lot of people who God's will, but in reality, uh, they are blinded. And sometimes God would have to let you get knocked off your donkey and there would be a revelation so that you can see exactly what God is calling and leading you to do and be. And so now we are in Acts chapter number 10. And uh, we're going to ask if you would just read along with us as we discover what happens to Saul now after he is knocked off his donkey and he's being led. Acts chapter 9 verse 10 and if you have it, it says these words. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judah, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hand on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is chosen instrument of mine. And uh, check this out. He's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed into the house and laying his hand on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus is on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales from his eyes fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at the and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And verse number 21 of Acts 
chapter 9 says, And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to him them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the heard this, they brought him down to Caesarea. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Verse number 32 says these words. Now as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down to the saints who lived in Lydia. There he found a man named Aeneas, bedridden for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Verse number 36. And there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated mean Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days she became ill and died. And when they had uh, washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside, knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up and gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive, and it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon. So in the book of Acts, we've completed reading the entire chapter 9 of Acts. Now one thing we come to see, number one, is that Paul is led to Damascus to a man by the name of Ananias. Now when he before he gets there, Ananias has this dream. And in the dream, the Lord tells Ananias that this man Saul is going to come. Ananias had a problem with this dream, and he questioned the Lord because he had heard that Saul had been a persecutor of the Christians. And so there was no way in the world, in Ananias' mind, that God would use such a dastard evil person to do his will. And then God had to reassure Ananias, listen, I've had an encounter with Paul of a third kind on the Damascus road. He has turned his life around. He's blinded, but I need you to lay hands on him so that he can see. This is very difficult for Ananias to comprehend that God could use someone like Paul or Saul to do his work. And I come to tell you that there are many people right now who are going to come to the church who don't look like someone that God can use to do the work of the gospel. Right now, we're caught up in the midst of a voting, uh, a voting, uh, I don't know what you would call it, crises, where we have the Trump followers and the Biden followers waiting to hear what the answers are going to be for who won the election. And this is causing a disturbance. Because we're trying to question what is God's will going to be for the United States if Trump wins? 
what is God's will going to be for the United States if Biden wins? And I come to tell you all, brothers and sisters, don't worry about who's going to win the race. Because whoever wins, God's will is going to be done. See, God's will is not predicated on the person. God uses the person so that his will will forever pray. Praying to God. Those who have never considered faith found themselves now considering God's will. We have people right now, because of the coronavirus, who have come to know Jesus Christ. So God can use any situation to receive the glory. And this is a lesson that Ananias had to learn. Can God really receive the glory from a man? For he is chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. It's very important to note that each one of us are chosen to carry the word of God to a particular group of people. I cannot reach everybody. So that's why God has each one of us to serve as chosen vessels so that we can carry the gospel to a particular group. The Bible says that the gospel before kings and before the Gentiles and before the children of Israel. That's very important. There are people who are running for Congress right now who God is going to use to get his will done in the United States and in the world. And we don't know who those people are. But whoever they are, we must accept that this is God's will. Whoever the president of the United States is, whether it's the candidate of your choice, we've got to must be done. Whether or not you agree with God's will, it must be done. Ananias did not agree initially that, that Saul could be a vessel, a chosen vessel of God. The text says that he is a chosen vessel. There are some people who are chosen for a particular purpose. You do remember that Judas, Judas was chosen to betray Jesus to Christ. There are people who are chosen vessels of God that will become stumbling blocks for you because God will use them to get you to a place of total commitment to his will. You ever wondered why you go to work sometimes and there are some people who are like pins in your side? They always get on your nerves. But God has chosen them to be a vessel for some particular purpose. You always ask the question, why is it that the good seem to die and suffer while the bad seem to prosper? Well, I come to tell you that the good, the bad, and the ugly are chosen of God. And the good news is that God does not care how pretty you are. There are some, body, there are some people, you know, I knew a preacher one time, and I'm not going to lie. I'm not the most handsomest guy in the world. I know that. I, you know... I don't, I don't have the looks of, of, of all the famous actors. I'm, I'm just an average looking guy, maybe a little bit below average for some. But you know, I said that for this reason. I knew this preacher, and man, this preacher was the ugliest preacher I'd ever seen in my life. I mean, when you look at him, you just, uh, you just said, C could God really do this? I mean, he was not good for the eyes. But God had chosen him to preach the gospel. And I used to wonder, I said, how can somebody look at him while he preached? I mean, it was just that bad. I mean, he was very, he was disfigured. He was, he was just not a, a common looking person to look upon. But can I tell you something? When that brother opened his mouth to preach, whatever he looked like, the gospel made him look 10 times better. Because when you're chosen of God, it doesn't matter how bad you look, how broke, busted, and disgusted you look. God's gospel has a way of taking all your ugliness and making you look so attractive. There are some people right now who have had some ugly lifestyles, but because they have come in contact with the gospel, God has made them a chosen vessel for his glory. And this is the case with uh, Saul. The Bible says that... Uh, the Bible says that, uh, and right there in verse number fifteen, that that uh, Ananias had to go and, and 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 lay hands on him. But here's the thing: when you're chosen a vessel of God, the Bible says to Ananias, the reason why he is chosen, the reason why I'm sending you, 
is because I want you to show him how he is going to suffer for my name's sake. That's an important thing to remember. Saul had caused many others to suffer. And now when he took on the name of Christ and became a chosen vessel, his life was not going to be made easier. But his life would now become one of suffering. And that's the word for you. There's not going to be time to suffer. You're going to, be, you're going to lose your family. You're going to lose friends. You're going to lose positions. You might even lose jobs. You might lose possessions. And that's a hard pill to swallow, especially in this age when prosperity gospel tells you that if you're following the commandments of God, you'll never be in lack. But the truth of the matter is that when you follow God, there are going to be many times that your life is going to be characterized by suffering. That's why Paul says, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. That your life is going to be a life of suffering. And the Bible says that what uh, Ananias had to show was how greatly he was going to suffer for the cause of Christ. I dare say that God has not revealed to all of us how much we would suffer for the cause of Christ. And in fact, the truth of the matter is that if God revealed how much suffering we would have to go through in order to reach many of our goals and visions, many of us would give up because none of us really want to suffer. But Paul had to be shown that he was going to suffer for the cause of Christ. And so the, the Bible says that Ananias um, uh, meet Saul, he lays his hands on him, and the Bible says that uh, it was like scales fell off his eyes, and he immediately was able to see. He was baptized, and uh, he started confessing Jesus. Look at verse chapter 9. And immediately something like scales from, fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. He could always see because God had made him blind. It was not until Ananias laid hands on him and allowed the Holy Spirit to enter him that he regained his natural sight. But just as he regained his natural sight, and I is also and I allowed Saul to regain a new spiritual sight. He was now able to be born again. You know, when babies enter the world, their eyes are closed. The only thing they know is what they've seen in the womb, if they can see at all. But once they come into the open, they open their eyes and they experience a new world. It's like the scales are removed from their eyes. And this is sort of what happens when you are born again. You have a different outlook on life. You know, the uh, senior saints used to say the places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. The people I used to see, I don't see them anymore. Because there's a, a new, you have a newborn soul. You have a new sight. You don't want to cuss folk all, all the time. You don't want to be around people who only want to do evil for evil. And the Bible says that, that Saul was baptized. And after he was baptized, the Bible says that he ate his food, and he was strengthened. It's important to note that once you come into the kingdom of God, it's not enough just to receive Jesus Christ in your life. But in the text, the Bible says that physically Saul was weak and he had to eat his food. And once you come into the kingdom of God, you're, you're spiritually weak. You're like a newborn babe. You're excited, but you need food. And Saul needed uh, food. And the Bible says that he ate and was strengthened. And as he was strengthened, he regained his, his opportunity to do work in the kingdom. You know, there's a Bible, a verse in the Bible that says about the importance 
of eating spiritual food and the importance of eating and drinking the sensual milk, which is the word of God. Uh, I would like for you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And let me give you a few seconds to turn there. 1 Peter chapter 2. And my Bible the pages are sticking to get together here. I don't know why. And this is not a new Bible. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why are these pages sticking? 1 Peter chapter 2. And when you have it, just say amen. If you're on a conference call, so I know that you have arrived to 1 Peter chapter 2. And uh, amen. very good. So 1 Peter chapter 2 simply says these words. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good, and you come to him a living stone rejected by man, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What is 1 Peter chapter 2 simply saying? And this is Peter who is writing it to those uh, Gentiles. What he's really saying is that we, when you come to the knowledge of Christ, there's some things you need to put away. And that's what Paul had to do. Everybody was afraid of Paul, but there's some things that you got away. Uh, uh, Peter says, number one, put away all malice. Your anger, you got to put it away. Paul was, Peter was an angry person at the Christians. Uh, and uh, put away hypocrisy. And envy and, and stop talking about folk and gossiping. And like newborn babes, long for the spiritual milk of the word of God. If you're going to grow, your growth comes from you studying the scriptures and your private time in prayer. And if you're not reading the Bible every day, if you're not praying every day, then you're missing out on what your spiritual purpose is. Your spiritual growth does not come from just coming to church. It doesn't come from Bible study. It comes when you get into the word of God. And when you get into the word of God, then you find yourself growing spiritually. Turn to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Paul had to develop this and had to, to grow up. And many times, some of the foolishness that happens in the church, some of the arguments, and some of the places that we are in our spiritual growth is a result of not us not having a sincere prayer life on a daily basis. Is a result of us not reading the word of God on a, a daily basis. You should memorize scripture. Turn to Psalms 119. And I want you to see what David says about this. Psalms 119. It says, verse number 11, it says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. This thing has to be in your heart. It can't be just memory verses that you put in your mind. If you're going to grow spiritually, your growth is not going to come because you participate in the church. It ain't going to come because you go to Bible study. 
guess what? It ain't my job, the pastor's job, to make you grow spiritually. I'm like, a, you know, uh, before I came this morning, I went and worked out. I've been trying to lose weight. Y'all know that, right? And so when I go there, there is a spiritual, there is a trainer. You know, I don't know what you call them, the trainers. What do you call those people, Ife, who help you get in shape? They call trainer. Yeah, a physical trainer. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there's a, a physical trainer, and he's been giving me pointers on how I can get stronger. He's telling me everything I need to do, right? Mm -hmm. But him just telling me what I need to do is not enough. I can tell you the scripture. I can tell you how to live right. I can tell you that you need to love everybody. But until I get on the tread machine, until I start lifting the weights and exercising, I don't get any better. My, my strength does not improve. And I want to say to you is that you can come to church your whole entire life for 50 to 60 years. Listen to the same Bible verses, hear the same scriptures, the same sermons, mm -hmm. and still be a baby in Christ. You might have a PhD uh, from your college or university, a PhD. You might be a, a, a superstar in your job. You might be beloved by your family and friends and still be a kindergartner in the spiritual things of God. Beloved, you've got to understand that there is a big difference between spirituality and theological depth. Let me say it again. Just because you're spiritual doesn't mean you are theologically deep. There are a lot of folk who can say, Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. They can say the words of God. And do all the speaking in tongues. They can pray until heaven falls. But having spirituality and shouting and lifting your hands and saying hallelujah doesn't that have anything to do with how much you know about God. In fact, you can know the scriptures and still be ignorant as a dumb man. There are a lot of folk in church right now in the pulpit who are spiritual and can talk. They fool you so good. They fool you so good. Oh, they look so prim and proper. They speak so nice. They are so polished but dumb as a bag of rocks in the things of God. When the Bible talks about hypocrites in 1 Peter, he's talking about folk who are leading people astray. Not necessarily leading them away from God, but causing division within the body of Christ. Anybody, God gives you the leader of the church, which is the pastor. Now, you might not like it, but I'm, I'm the set person of God in the house. Just as in the family, I know that people don't believe this, and I know a lot of Methodist folk don't believe this, but God has chosen the man. <laughs> okay, now don't get mad at me. You get mad at the word. And the reason why our world is in the shape that it's in today is because a lot of our men have been... Uh, uh, met, em, is that a word called emasculated? Where we've taken the manhood away from man Ooh. and say that there is no need for gender, that everybody, uh, we're, we're all genderless society, that there is no role for a man and there's no role for a woman, that a man can be whatever he wants to be. And if he want to be a little girl, he can be a little girl and a girl can be whatever she wants to be. If she want to be a mm -hmm. little boy, then she can be a little mm -hmm. boy. I come to tell you that there is a role for each one of us. That's right. And the word of God has placed what that role is. And what has happened is that we have emasculated men to the point where they no longer want to be men. We have babied them. Even in the language, if we listen to the language of men, back in the day, um, when we saw, back when back not my day, but my daddy's day, they saw a lady like, hey, what's up, mama? You know, you, they used to call them mama. What's up, mama? And today, I, I still hear men calling ladies that they're mama. I got to go talk to mama. Or back in the day, they didn't call their house, you know, I'm going home. I'm going to the crib. Everything that related to women was always nurturing and the man been taken care of. I need a woman to cook for me. I need a woman to wash my clothes and all of that. And I'm saying that there is a role, and that doesn't mean that women are to be subservient to men, 
But at the same time, it also means that we got to stop raising little boys to be babies and allow them and teach them to be men. Amen. Now, what does it mean to teach a man how to be a man? Teach a man how to take care of his responsibilities. Stop trying to do everything for that little boy. He ain't got to have the best clothes, the best Jordans. He ain't got to have every game to come out. Teacher tell you he acting a fool in class. You gonna want, want to go up there and fight the teacher. When you go out spiritually, desire the sensible work of the word of God, the way you interact with your family evolve. The way you deal with church. We got folk in the church still saying, well, we don't want to worship with this group because we want to keep our stuff to ourselves. No, that ain't what God is about. The, God, the church ain't here for you. I mean, some of us think that we own the church. Like, this is your church. No, Negro, this ain't your church. This is lonely God. And Paul is saying, Saul was a persecutor of the church. And what, am I too harsh on y'all? I'm always talking that way. See, in Bible class, I can talk like this. This is Bible class. This is what it's for. It's to get into the Word to help you grow. But when I, Sunday morning, I give you some pep. I give you some, some, some sugar. Every now and then, I got to give you some salt. Salt is good as long as it is seasoning the food. But every now and then, I got to give you some medicine. Because sometimes when you get headaches, y'all ever had a headache? Mm. When you get a headache, you got to take, um, like, like uh, migraine, extra strength pills, you get rid of a headache. Well, the church has a spiritual headache right now. And the reason why we have a spiritual headache is because we have too many of us who have been spoon-fed false theology. And because of the false theology, it has shot our blood pressure all the way up. It has given some of us shit of diabetes because we got these feel-good Bible studies that we feel good when it's over, but you have not grown one iota. So you still come to church acting like a fool, raising hell 100 miles per hour, doing what you want to do. And the minute somebody tells no to you, you're ready to fight. And so my job as the pastor is to give you some medicine. And the first medicine I'm going to give you is the word of God. In the book of Psalms, David says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, you don't know what sin is if you're not reading the Bible. The only time some of us pick up the Bible is when we come to church on Sunday morning. Saul, going back to Acts, Transition. Saul, in the book of Acts, chapter 9, once he had realized that he had uh, become blinded, he needed the help of Ananias to lay hands on him so that the scales would be removed. And then he was going to see how he was going to suffer. My job is to remove, to lay hands on you so that those scales can be removed from your eyes. So that you can see that it ain't my job to make you grow. It is my job to be your physical therapist, your physical trainer. Some of y'all say, I've been trying to call a pastor. I can't get in touch with a pastor. I need counseling. But I'm giving you group therapy right now. All of y'all listen to me. This is group therapy. I'm giving you group therapy. I'm telling you how to, to get yourself together as the group. Come to Bible study and get group therapy sometimes. I'm telling you how you can improve your spiritual life. You want a, a better, better, better marriage? I can tell you about that. I was married 27 years before she left me. You want to know how you have a better marriage? I'm telling you how you better marriage. Y'all do things together in the word of God. Y'all become one and not divided. And it doesn't mean, you know, and sometimes people, you know, go their separate ways. It's okay. Just get back up on your horse and keep on going. You know, God has sent somebody else. Not that I'm looking, you know, I'm perfectly defined the way I am. You know, I'm having the ball of my life. I'm able to go and preach this gospel, stay out as late as I want to, getting people saved. The scales were removed from my eyes when I saw how God can use me in greater ways. Sometimes God has to remove people from your eyes. Because sometimes the scales, it may not necessarily be, the physical scales are perhaps those that blind us, but there are some metaphorical scales that stop us from seeing what God wants us to do. It could be your job. So God might have to let you lose your job so that you can see what his call is for your life. He's been trying to tell you to start your own business for a long time, but you just won't do it. Some of y'all right now should be multi-millionaires 
God is giving you the vision, but you're too afraid. Ananias in this text was afraid of Saul. God told Ananias that I'm going to use Saul to do work for me, but he was afraid. What if he stayed in his fear? He would have never been able to do what God has called him to be. What if you stop being afraid to go back and get your college degree? What would happen if you stopped being afraid to take another chance at love? What would happen if you would just be afraid? You could open the door. I know it's hot. You know it's hot in this office. You know why it's hot in this office? Because the heat is on and we close the door. And when you close the door, all the heat consumes us. And that's the way some of us have done with our lives. Our lives have become uncomfortable because we refuse to open the doors of our mind and let a fresh wind come in to allow us to see something different that God might want to do. Ananias laid hands on Saul and his eyes were opened. And look what happened next. The Bible says that after he saw Saul went to preaching. Don't, don't miss the point. He went to preaching to the very folk he was talking to to convince them to stone Christians, to persecute Christians. Check this out. Paul went back to the people who used to help him kill Christians and told them about Jesus. Don't miss it. There's some prostitutes that God is going to take off the corners. He's going to clean them up and save them and send them back to the other prostitutes to get them to know God. There's some folk who used to hang out at the club. God bless them. See, that's why I'm talking to y'all who say y'all shouldn't go to a club. No, I'm telling y'all you should go to the club. Check this out. There's some folk who used to hang out at the club all night long, get drunk. God going to save them and send them back to the club to lead others back. It ain't going to be them toting the scripture that's going to lead others to Christ. It's going to be now when they go back to the club. They ain't going to the club simply to find a mate or simply to dance all night long and have fun. But they're going back to the club just so that people can also see how God can take somebody who is a persecutor of Christ. And many of us have been persecutors of Christ in the church. We persecute Christ when we try to stop whatever God's will is for the church. God is saying it's time for us to, to expand our territory, to reach out to different people, to try something to do. And every time God sends a vision, you got you to always have that doubt in tongue. Hmm. Well, whose idea was that? Hmm. None of your business. It was God's idea. Just do what God called you to do. Stay in your lane. What would have happened if Ananias said no to God? I'm telling you what happened. God would have killed him and sent somebody else to do it. Whenever you get in the way of God, God will just move you out the way and bring somebody else to do what you won't do. If God is telling you to go back to school, get your college degree so that you could do more work for him in the kingdom and you refuse to do it, God will just go ahead and let you roll over, get rolled over by life and bring somebody else who will get that college degree or start that job so that his will will be done. Let me help you. Everybody can't be in ministry full time. There got to be some people who go out in the community and work so that we can fund ministry. Mm -hmm. Not everybody. Some, some of y'all, we need you to work in the secular job so that you can bring your tithes and offerings in so that we can do more work in the kingdom. God sends the resources to the people who he sends to, to expand the territory. I'm looking at millionaires every Sunday, and they don't know they're millionaires because they refuse to do what God has called them to do. Follow your dream. Stop listening to the naysayers that says you can't. Start your business. Go on back to school. You can do it. I see Brother C that walked in. How you doing, Brother C? We're in the middle of Bible study. You come on in. I'm just talking to the folk about Bible study. I was telling Brother C. Now, I see Brother C, but I like about Brother C. Come on over here, Brother C. You got your mask on. Well, I was telling Brother C, Brother C likes to come sometimes. Come on in, Brother C. Come on in. Come on in the picture. You, you could with me. See, look, look, Brother C is cleaning the border help. Look at him. Come on over here. Look, look at Brother C. He's cleaning the border help. But let me tell you something about Brother C. Look, look here. See, Brother C, that's Brother C. Now, let me tell you something about Brother C. Brother C loves to lift weights. 
Now, Brother C been telling me a long time, for a few weeks now, what I need to do to lose weight. I'm going to get you some. I'm gonna, I'm, I got some stuff for you as soon as we get a chance. And look, look at See, he telling me he got some stuff for you. In six months. In six months. Listen. Say it. In six months, they ain't going to know you. Listen, listen. Now, here's uh -huh. the thing about Brother C. I'm Saul. <laughs> Brother C is Ananias. God sent Ananias <laughs> oh, but I know so that, that Ananias. I... I know about Ananias. So I that know. I can see. Now listen. I know about Ananias. Listen, listen, brother. See, <laughs> it ain't enough for you to tell me you got something that's going to work for me. Yeah. I got to take what you tell me and use it. That's right. After Saul got released and was able to see again, the Bible says in Acts chapter 9, look here. Look here. You all right, brother. See? Okay. You all right. Uh, don't, 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 don't get, don't get, don't, don't leave. It says, from some days he was, in, in Acts chapter 9, uh, uh, verse number 19, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, he is the son of God. This is the same Saul who was saying that he was not the son of God. Now notice, he just didn't go up in the synagogue and tell, tell, start telling people, that, that Jesus is the Son of God. He went to Damascus and hung out with, him. with the disciples. Right. Now some of you are saying, I don't need no church. Mm -hmm. I can stay at home, watch it on the internet. That's not the same. It ain't the same. Why ain't the same, brother? No, 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 no. no tell wait, me. Wait, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, with, 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 with tech, we have to do what we have to do. Yeah. We have to do this. Because like I said, our churches are shut down mm -hmm. now, but we are still having church. Here's the thing that people don't understand about church. Church has two facets. Tell, tell us about it, Doc. It's the who and the what. Mm -hmm. The who is you are looking at church. I am church. You are church. We are church. Uh -huh. That's the who? It's not a building. Huh? Sit. It's not a building. Yeah. Now, and I said it's too fast. Tell me a second so I go on. And the what? Tell me about the what. The what? What is? What is it? We are to be disciples. We are to go out and do what Jesus taught. He said, "What's the last?" Go into all the world. Matthews. Go. Go. To the world. Yeah. Now, all that I taught you. Now, listen. Brother C is making a good point. What he's basically saying is the same thing I said. We're in COVID, so you can't come to the building. <laughs> That's true. But what you can do is come to this Bible study. There you go. What you can do is open your Bible up every day and every study day. and pray. That's right. And read. That's right. Now, 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 listen. The Bible says that Saul... Hung out with the disciples. With the disciples. That's he right. didn't hang out with who's who. That's right. He, hung out with he the stopped disciples. hanging around the folk who were leading him astray and started hanging out with the. See, the problem is, honey, we the reason why some of us are not going because we're trying to hang on to to the past when God is trying to move us to the future. That's right. We're trying to drive forward, looking in the rearview mirror. What did, wait a what, what? what did Jesus say? What did he say? He said. Where are you going now? You, you got to come, come, no, come back over he, here. He, he who puts his hand to the plow. And what? And looks back. It's not what? Ain't fit for the kingdom see, of heaven. No, no, see, 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 I didn't say that. See <laughs> said that. Listen, if you're looking back, look at, to, look, look, look at me here. Look at my eyeball. <laughs> if you're looking back, questioning the call that God has given for you, and you quit, and you quit, and don't come back. You ain't fit for the kingdom. That's what he said. Don't tell me you want to go to heaven, but you quit every time you get mad. You know, I used to play basketball, and uh, when I went on the court, yeah. brother, see, check, let me tell you what they did to me. It was my basketball now. Oh, you take my ball home, <laughs> right? I get on the court, and you know when you're playing basketball. You call, I got next. Yeah. I had next. I picked the team. Okay. I'm 
I'm on the court playing, but nobody passes me the ball. Mm -hmm. I get mad. Right. So you know what I did? I stopped the game. I said, I'm taking my ball home. There you go. I'm Take taking my ball, ball home because I'm on the team and you won't pass me the ball so I can shoot. At least. That ain't God's way. No. Some of us think that because you own the ball, because <laughs> you get the most money, that the ball, since the ball belongs to you, you determine how far the game goes. But I come to tell you, ain't no one monkey to stop no show. Yeah. I knew that. And what did he say? See, you, 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 you done started something over here, see. I, now, who am I talking to? I'm talking to some folk yeah. who are not going to be progressive enough, who only keep on looking at the building and not, and not focusing on the mission. The mission is to make new, new disciples that will transform this world. If you ain't trying to make no disciples, and if you're only here because you want to increase your 501c3, mm -hmm. you're only here because you want a political aspiration, then you, see, that's Jesus on the main line, call him up. <laughs> if it ain't Jesus, don't, don't answer it. I, I, I ain't no good sometimes. Y'all got to pray for me. It's, Hello. Listen, now see, go out there and talk, you see. Go see, you got to go out there and talk. It's 1132, y'all. 1032. It's 1132. It's 1132? It's time to go. Well, we got far in the text today. We went all the way to Paul proclaiming in the synagogue. And the point I want to make is that while he was proclaiming, he first had to be around the disciples so that he could learn and increase his knowledge. And the Bible says and that everybody who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man? Look at verse number 21 of Acts chapter 9. Is not this the man who made Havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But look at what he says. They, they reminded Saul of what his mission used to be. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. The more they talk about him, the more he increased his faith. Stop asking the Lord. Listen. You asking the Lord to increase your faith? Let me tell you how the Lord increases your faith. The, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this one. This is for free. This is group therapy today, and I'm giving a group counseling session to everybody, so that everybody will get it at the same time. Um, so I'm gonna tell you how. To increase your faith. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Now, now you've been not only have you been asking for the Lord to increase your faith, but really the, the question is, how do I have more patience? Because some of us are so impatient. Mm. Mm. We want things done right now and right here. Turn to Romans chapter 5. See, Paul had to increase his faith and his patience. Turn to Romans chapter 5. And see, I got a problem with patience. Because sometimes, you know what made me become more a patient person? Dealing with churches. Because I realized that everything ain't going to go my way. And it's okay. And, you know... I was at, Ames taught me very good. I thank God for the saints of Ames who taught Reverend Hudson how to slow down. Yep. So I became a better person slow at Metropolitan, and they teaching me too. And, uh, and St. James is teaching me how to have patience. Because you just don't go up in no church and say what you're going to do. You got to learn the people and love them. My first job is to love the hell out of them. I'm going to love the hell out of you. No matter what you do, I love you. Uh, that's my new slogan. I'm going to love the hell out of you. I'm going to love you so much that any hell that's in you, it's got to go. Some of y'all love the hell out of me. 
You say, I can't make him mad for anything because I love the hell out of you. That's why. Look at Romans chapter 5. Y'all got it? Yep. Okay. Am I talking too much? Oh, uh, Sister Betty. Oh, Sister Betty. Lord Jesus. Uh -huh. Say something, Sister Betty. Yeah, Sister Betty, tell us how you doing right now. Right now, I'm feeling very well. The doctor says I don't have to come back for another six weeks. And I praise the Lord for that because I've been praying all the time. And he said I don't have to come back for another six weeks. I'm feeling very well. I'm able to walk around, but I'm using a walker. He wanted me to use a walker when I come out, and I use a cane when I'm inside of my house. I have Lord Jesus. You sound strong. Yeah. Huh? Don't start nothing. Mama. Thank you, Jesus, Sister Betty. So we've been talking about song. It's somebody, somebody's wish coming about. Well, praise the Lord. I hear a lot of talking. That's okay. We're going to stop it for a minute. And I want everybody to turn to Romans chapter 5. And we're going to talk about, just for a minute, how you can increase your patience and faith. Because some of us have been waiting on God and he ain't showed up yet. Paul was at, Saul was at a place where he was being led. And he had to hang out with disciples. And I believe during that time, his faith and his patience increased. Can I show you how to increase your patience? Y'all yeah, ready? I need it, yes. Yeah. Look at, let's start at Romans chapter 5 verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith. Being justified means that we've been made just. Not because of what you did. But you've been justified by your faith in Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access by faith and to this grace in which we stand and we rejoice. And hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Ah! You have peace with God because of your faith and you're able to rejoice in your sufferings knowing, check this out, that suffering produces endurance. Okay. You want to know how you're able to endure? It's like when you suffer, it's like being on a treadmill. When you go on a treadmill, you might only be able to do 15 minutes. But if you keep on going every other day, it'll go to 20 minutes. It produces endurance. And when you are going on suffering, Knowing that suffering produces endurance. Look at verse 4 of Romans chapter 5. And endurance produces character. Character is the ability to do the right thing when ain't nobody else is looking. Mm. A bag of money on the table, and they, they thought no cameras was around, and nobody counted that bag of money. Take some of them, because they ain't got no good character. People who cheat when nobody's around, they cheat because of their character. But when you go through some suffering, it produces character. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. You get hope when once you've been through something, knowing that God is going to make a way out of no way. And your character allows you to keep on going and not quit. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That's how you produce patience. By suffering. And if you give up 
time you have a disagreement, y'all talking about the eye to eye, then you're not allowing God's work to be done. You don't quit going through something. Through you produce this endurance and character. People who've been together for 50 years will tell you that they didn't stay together because things were perfect. Mm. They stayed together because they endured the suffering. And during the suffering, they built that character to know, you know, I can't do this because it's going to make somebody mad. I'm done, y'all. And Paul had to go through the suffering in order to get to the character, in order to have patience and more hope. We're going to nine next week uh, to finish it. We're going verse by verse. No, we did. I read it. But we don't Paul now preaching in the temple because we still got to deal with these miracles that, that's going to happen. So we're going to stop. I want to remind everybody tonight is charge conference. You don't know how to get into the charge conference. I am going to tell you now how to do it. Are y'all ready? So if you're on the telephone, dial 301 715 8592. That's what you dial on the telephone. At that? And after you dial that number, you're going to put in your meeting ID. That's going to be 992 9077 Now, after you put in that meeting ID, you're going to have to put in a passcode. Hello now. You want to know what the passcode is? Prayers of Kiva, faith a lot to do. Here's the passcode. The passcode. The meeting ID is 992 8606. Yep, that's 06-8606. You're welcome. There is no Bible study tonight with Reverend Anissa, but I thank you for coming to the Bible study with the Reverend Hudson, where we have explored the deep recesses, resources of this text. Amen. Well, God bless you. We're going to talk to you later. And I uh, hope, you, hope you enjoyed our time together. Let us pray. God, we thank you for our time together. We pray in Jesus' name that you will, God, continue to heal, deliver, to make whole. That you will, God, uh, be a fence all around us every day. That you will, God, Continue to heal those who are sick. Visit the nursing home. We call the name of Sister Marie, Maria Gray. We call the name of Miriam Curtis. We thank you for Sister Betty. We call the name of Sister Hattie. God, so many names we can call. We call the name of Sister Myra Curtis. <coughs> Sister Leola Bassard, God. We call the name of Sister Pearl Holland. So many names we can call. Sister Reverend Ada Jones. God speak and be with them now. And Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys and ladies. We'll talk to you later. Be blessed. Bye-bye. Yeah. I just met with uh, Long Fence. <laughs> what did they say? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. Go ahead. Y'all.